This is a CBC Podcast. What do you think is the one thing that instantly identifies you as Canadian on the Internet? The answer is simple. It's a .ca domain name. Think about it. When you look at a website and you see it's a .ca, you immediately recognize it as Canadian. And here's the important part. 62% of Canadians prefer shopping on Canadian websites. So, when you're choosing a domain, choose Canada's domain. Get your .ca domain name at www.choose.ca. A large crowd had uh, assembled. I was amongst them in front of the old Winnipeg City Hall. There were thousands of people there. I'm Paul Kennedy, and this is Ideas. I came running out there to be faced with a number of horses coming right abreast, all the way charging down the street. The longest strike in Canadian history happened in my hometown, and I'd never heard of it. The Winnipeg General Strike began on May 15, 1919. 35,000 people took to the streets for six weeks. It was the biggest labor action in Canadian history. They will condemn all the workers as being these kind of red communist Bolsheviks. Look what's happening in the Soviet Union. That's what's going to happen here. We have to suppress this movement. I saw the mounted police coming down from Broadway, and they were all carrying uh, baseball bats. By this time, the crowd, they're panicked. The police are firing. This is a Canadian city, but why are the police firing on their own citizens? This, this is not something that happens, right? One man dropped with a bullet through his breast. And they ran like rabbits, like rabbits. When it was over by June, two people were dead and scores injured. The strike was settled not through negotiation, but through police and military violence, all just a couple of blocks from Portage and Maine, now one of Canada's busiest intersections. From our present perch, what is the legacy of that whole situation in Winnipeg? I think what's hard for people to grasp today is how they did this collectively. It's hard to imagine 30-some thousand people in downtown Winnipeg for anything but a rally for the Winnipeg Jets today. It was a different world. Winnipeg contributor Tom Jokinen talks to historians and experts on the strike and, through archival recordings from the Manitoba Museum, brings us the voices of people who were there, on the streets and on strike. You never forget in 1919 the general strike in Winnipeg. Oh, that was... That was something. They turned the streetcar over and set it on fire. They wouldn't let anybody work. The only uh, thing that they didn't turn off was the power, uh, lights, and so on. But otherwise, everything was at a standstill. If there's an iconic image of the strike, it's that streetcar and the men trying to tip it over on Main Street. You can see it on the Ideas website cbc.ca slash ideas. They were angry at the scab labor that was running it. It was June 21st, 1919, the day now known as Bloody Saturday. But if none of this is ringing a bell, that's okay. We have the same problem here in Winnipeg. The first time I heard about the strike, I was in my early 20s. I had never heard about this in any of my schooling. Uh, born and raised in Winnipeg. The longest strike in Canadian history happened in my hometown and I'd never heard of it. My name is Janice Thiessen and I'm professor of history here at the University of Winnipeg. Some people came out of that thinking that collective action is inevitably going to be defeated when the power rests with the state. Uh, I think you had other people who came out of it thinking that collective action is the only way to go. It's the only counterpoint to the power of the state. So the first day must have been worrying at first, just to wonder how it was going to go, and then an incredible sort of adrenaline rush when you just sort of see a modern city, the third biggest city in Canada, just grind to a halt in a couple hours. Now, I don't mind frankly confessing to you, I've always felt an inner sense of gratification in the memory that amongst others, I too threw a stone at the charging Mounties. 
My only regret is that my aim was so damn poor, I missed. <laughs> the violence and the strike itself would leave Winnipeggers arguing about it for decades. It cost the citizens of Winnipeg and the province of Manitoba untold millions of dollars of progress. And I think you'll have to agree with that. I certainly will not agree with that. Why not? Because what we did in 1919, while we certainly were beaten. Oh, no, you weren't beaten. Oh, yes, we no. were. No, you and defeated we, yourselves. And we had to crawl back to work, those of us who could get back. But the fact is that that strike brought on what we now know as collective bargaining. Oh, come off it. Here's this amazing historical event that happened in a, you know, a place that I thought nothing ever happened in. The city of Winnipeg didn't lose millions of dollars as you say they did. <laughs> the city we lost a generation. Oh, I don't see that at all. Winnipeg, all those years, investment wouldn't come into the city. Everybody knew it. It was a red setup. There was more it's money It's in the books. There's more money coming in after the strike than there is now. You know the odd part of it is? They're all sorry today. <laughs> but why Winnipeg, right in the middle of Canada? Why not Montreal or Toronto or Vancouver? So Winnipeg isn't just sort of some event that comes out of nowhere. It has a, it's rooted in the, in the history of the city and, and indeed in the history of the labor movement across the country. One of the leading historians on the strike is Nolan Riley, now retired from the University of Winnipeg. By 1918, across the country, you see unionization rates, uh, strikes, level of strikes you haven't seen in Canada before. And there seems to be this upswelling of uh, militancy and solidarity. Workers are angry because there was all these promises before the war and the promises of capitalism that it was going to make the world better. It was going to make the world better for everyone. That uh, this rapid industrialization was, was going to really improve things for them. I'm beginning to understand the significance of the labor church in, in all of this. And the labor church holds meetings across Winnipeg, across the working class neighborhoods. You, they hold meetings at the Ukrainian labor temple in the, in the North End. The North End is across the CPR tracks, up from the more prosperous South. And it has an attitude about capitalism. For 51 years, they elected communist aldermen to city council. Until just a few years ago, there was a sign you could see crossing the slaw Rebchuk Bridge. It said, people over profits. The Ukrainian labor temple, yes, is one of the, the most amazing sites because there are so few labor temples left. And to see it and, and, and learn that it was physically built and uh, paid for by Ukrainian workers living in Winnipeg, and then to see, you know, the, the carving uh, above the doors and reminding folks that, you know, there is this uh, shared experience. That carving above the door is straight out of Karl Marx. Workers of the world unite. I'm meeting historian you Nolan Riley and Lily Stearns. Yeah, She's a volunteer at the temple. This is Glad to meet you. We're standing in the main hall of the Ukrainian Labor Temple on uh, Pritchard Avenue in, in North End, uh, Winnipeg. Uh, this area of the city in 1919 was predominantly uh, Central and Eastern European immigrants. The Ukrainians were one of the largest communities in the city. The hall uh, had a main theater in it, which uh, would hold about 1,000 people. What would happen during the strike? What were the well, uh, we, they had uh, apparently, they, the women brought uh, sandwiches for the strikers. Uh, there were meetings here, so that was an important f uh, use for the hall. Uh, the curtain there has got some, is that original? The... Yes, yes. And what does it say? Uh, well, it, uh, it's on the left-hand side. It's uh, send your children to Ukrainian school. Apparently, uh, in the 30s, there is a photograph in one of our books of a, of a huge uh, illustration of this idea of workers of the world unite. And there is a picture of a worker smashing the chains around the world. Now, that was painted over. 
one of the most important things was the press. They had a publishing empire down below, below the stage. Oh, what were they publishing? Uh, newspapers, journals, pamphlets, posters. During the strike? Well, the building was opened in uh, February of 1919. So it was brand new. Yeah, brand new. You can walk along the CPR railway tracks in Winnipeg, and you'll see you know, the, the old factories that date to that period. Many of them were supplying the railways, but others were involved in, in, uh, in building the West. You know, think of how quickly Canada is growing during the period before the war. And Winnipeg was the largest city in the West, and it was really the center out of which most of that kind of Western expansion uh, took place. Part of what you're saying, too, is what was unique about Winnipeg was the North End. It was a really interesting place to live. There was a conjunction of Ukrainians and Jews and Hungarians and Poles, Russians. Uh, it was a real community, and it, the feeling was anything was possible. <laughs> I'm James Naylor. I'm a professor of history at Brandon University in Manitoba. The big issue that really caused it to explode was the way the First World War intensified some issues like the vast unfairness of everything, right? There was a sense that what was happening in Europe was that working people were going to be killed by the millions in trenches and a handful of people were becoming fantastically rich, honestly or dishonestly. There was a sense, on one hand, of all of that unfairness, and it was just getting worse, and it was becoming deadly. We also want to remember that this was wartime. The war, in some ways, sort of propped up elements of the economy, like the agricultural economy, where farmers in Manitoba and elsewhere in Western Canada were feeding the forces. But the war also creates, of course, significant hardships for working class families. I'm Essel Jones, I'm a professor of history at University of Manitoba, and I'm also Dean of Studies at St. John's College. Can we talk about what prompted the strike? I mean, I know that's a huge subject, but what, mm -hmm. what, how did it start? Mm -hmm. So it was months in the making, if not years. There were some economic problems that were directly related to the way in which the government managed or failed to manage the war, where wages were flat, but there was no price control. Um, unlike in World War II, where there was much tighter overall regulation of the economy, in World War I, prices escalated significantly. Another factor was that the skilled trades were now highly organized but could not receive union recognition. So what we now assume to be the basic rights of collective bargaining, which have been supported by the courts, didn't exist in the early 20th century. And a lot of what that strike was about had to do with the basic right for union recognition. There were significant employers in Winnipeg who would not acknowledge any union. Workers are angry because there was all these promises before the war and the promises of capitalism that it was going to make the world better. It was going to make the world better for everyone. That uh, this rapid industrialization was, was going to really improve things for them. The authorities were utterly blind. These oral histories you're hearing were recorded in the early 1970s for the Manitoba Museum. You know, if I mistreat you, it brings the worst out of you. And this brought the worst out of the authorities, the establishment we'd call it today. I am Franca Yakoveta, and I'm a historian at the University of Toronto. Only a minority of the immigrant workers who become militant and become socialists arrive in Canada as socialists. Many of them, you know, a minority of them were already politicized, had some organizing skills, you know, worked with the left press and that kind of thing, and they certainly put their skills to work. But in terms of the, the, the wider population of immigrants, um, they arrive and they are just, they're working hard, right? They've got money they have to earn to send back to families, or they're trying to save up their pennies, they're working extremely hard, and it's really in many ways the Canadian experience that helps to radicalize them. So many of the laborers in Winnipeg were from Europe. Ukrainians, Hungarians, Poles. But the union organizers were mostly from Scotland and England, where the labor movement was radical. The leaders included J.S. Woodsworth, who'd eventually co-found the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation, or CCF. R.B. Russell, organizer of the One Big Union. Bill Pritchard, a West Coast labor activist. 
Richard Johns, George Armstrong, and it's not just men. Helen Armstrong and Kathleen Queen were also key organizers. But none of these Winnipeggers, man or woman, had ever run anything as big as a general strike. What's remarkable about Winnipeg is that there were at most about 12,000 unionized workers. They voted overwhelmingly to go out on a general strike. So on the evening of the general strike, you have people like R.B. Russell, and you have uh, Richard Johns, Dick Johns, Helen Armstrong, George Armstrong, I'm sure walking home from the Winnipeg Trades and Labor Council, where they've just voted to call a general strike, wondering, okay, our 12,000 unionized workers are going to go out on strike, but what's going to happen to all of those people who are not organized? What, will, will they help? Will they participate? Will they hold back? Because if they hold back, there's no general strike. Yes, at the time that the 1919 strike occurred, it began, as you know, on May the 15th, 1919. I was still then employed, I'd only been in the railway service for a little less than two years, as an office boy. I was only 17 years of age at the time, but I had joined the trade union organization in which I still carry my membership card. And I chose to walk out with the men and take my place in the ranks of the striking workers. So the first day must have been worrying at first, just to wonder how it's going to go, and then an incredible sort of adrenaline rush when you just sort of see a modern city, the third biggest city in Canada, just grind to a halt in a couple hours. Blacksmiths, railway clerks, Municipal so that when the strike began, police, 11 o'clock on the morning of May the 15th, upholsters, stationary engineers, within hours, 35,000 working machinists. residents of the city of Winnipeg had left their places of employment. Night fitters, plumbers, sheet metal workers, cooks and waiters. So what is, what is happening? Like what's, what's, what is, day, you wake up in the morning, what's going on in the city? They talk about how there's an eerie quiet in the city. Teamsters, jewelry workers, plasterers. Because the streetcars aren't running, most of the delivery services have been, have been shut down. The noise of the factories is gone. So it's, it's very this kind of eerie quietness in the city. But you also have many people going out. And the workers, by now, are going around from shop to shop. And if people are still working, they call them out. The people who are in these factories, who are in these retail shops, uh, who are working for the city, they all go out on strike on May 15th, 1919. Much to, I think, certainly to the delight, but also, I think, to the surprise of the leaders of the Winnipeg Trades and Labor Council. A remarkable thing about the first day of the strike was that it was supposed to start at 11 o'clock in the morning. Sharon Riley is a former curator at the Manitoba Museum. It started at 7 a.m. because 500 women operating the telephone lines refused to go to work. Who were the, what was the story of the Hello Girls? The first people to start the general strike were the telephone operators who stopped working. You know, the visual image is usually one of women sitting at a switchboard that was run with cables and literally pulling the plug on the telephone system. I can quite well recall the walkout, you know, as it took place on the CPR where I worked at the time. The workers there, they just poured through the gates in an atmosphere that almost uh, approached one of outright jubilation because there was a general feeling at the time that the strike would be of such magnitude that it would so completely tie up everything in the city of Winnipeg that it couldn't last for very long. Events proved otherwise. But well, we weren't on strike. My dad went to work. Well, and then the people would throw eggs at your place. You know, if, you, if they knew you were working, They'd come and throw eggs, and uh, we are not at our place. At our house. At, at their house. We get up in the morning, and our whole front window 
It's uh, littered with the raw eggs, you know. There were parades. Uh, I remember there were parades every day down 40th Avenue, and they were very noisy, and they were sometimes singing, sometimes shouting. And I remember there was guns around the Maryland Bridge going over to the legislative grounds, I suppose, guns and tanks and soldiers around the bridge. It was a scare. Fred Tipping was a member of the Carpenters' Union and a strike organizer. The philosophy of the strike at that time was do nothing. Commit no over at that. Do nothing. And they just, just met daily down in the Victoria Park. And in each of the suburban districts, we had speakers go out there and address meetings in each of those localities to keep the people informed as to how the strike was progressing. One of the things that's going on is that the mass meetings are being held on a regular basis at Victoria Park with the strike leaders going there to inform people about what's happening. And the Women's Labor League under Helen Armstrong start fundraising and open a soup kitchen. Uh, It starts off at the Strathcona Hotel on Main Street, very near Rupert in what was the old Cornwall Hotel as well. But they're serving hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of meals on a daily basis. Keeping people off the streets and making sure that there weren't opportunities for violence to erupt was another major purpose of the meetings at Victoria Park. So they had bicycle riding lessons and activities for children and entertainment. They reopened the theaters. Bill Pritchard was a strike leader. On the 50th anniversary of the strike in 1969, he spoke to CBC by phone from his home in Los Angeles. I addressed meetings out in Weston. I addressed one meeting in the daytime in Victoria Park, and there must have been about 22,000 people crammed into that thing. But I was told afterwards that everyone in that park could hear every word. They were up in the trees, and you remember the park, by the Labor Temple. I think I made a remark at that time that uh, only fools try to make revolutions. Wise men conform to them. That's the lesson of history. On that point, Mark Twain once said that a lie can get halfway around the world while the truth is putting on its shoes. You're listening to a documentary called The 1919 Winnipeg General Strike, 100 Years Later, by contributor Tom Jokinen. Ideas is heard on CBC Radio 1, Sirius XM, and cbc.ca slash ideas, where you can, of course, always get our podcast and see some haunting images of the strike, which began on May 15th, 1919. In response to the strike, the wheat barons, bankers, and business class of Winnipeg formed a secret group called the Citizens Committee of a Thousand. Their main job, propaganda. We had to form a citizens committee to patrol uh, residential districts, stop these fools from uh, starting uh, ringing false alarms, because citizens were manning the fire trucks and were rushing here and there to false alarms. I remember my brother uh, patrolling Armstrong's Point. He lived there uh, with others, uh, citizens, uh, patrolling to stop uh, these things. I mean, false alarms. The Citizens Committee is made up of uh, the uh, business elite of the city, the, the military, the senior military person in the city is part of that. Um, the senior politicians, they're they're part of this citizens committee and it's getting organized and it's going to be the focal point of resistance to the strike. They will condemn all the workers as being these kind of red communist Bolsheviks. Look what's happening in the Soviet Union. That's what's going to happen here. We have to suppress this movement. John Defoe was the editor of the Winnipeg Free Press, and he wrote this editorial. It is through the solid, fanatical allegiance of the Germans, Austrians, Huns, and Russians in the labor unions that the Red Five have climbed to power. The idea behind one big union is to employ these masses of rough, uneducated foreigners who know nothing of our customs and civilization. 
There was, of course, another less bombastic view of the strike. The strike was simply the collective endeavor by a group primarily of trade unionists and those sympathetic to the trade union movement to procure through peaceful agencies such as collective bargaining as large a measure as possible of the necessities of life. Now the strike was not in any sense of the word a revolution. It was a real stretch to consider it to be a revolutionary moment. Perhaps it was revolutionary in a more general sense, in the sense that it was seeking to transform relationships between workers and capital. We do not want revolution, insurrection, violence. It was not revolutionary in the sense that it sought to overturn a government. The Citizens Committee builds towards this idea. As you move into the second, third week of the strike, you see this, they actually start putting out news releases that's declaring that the cause of this strike is Bolshevism and the leaders of this strike are the uh, Eastern Europeans and Central Europeans. It's, it's the Ukrainians, it's the Jews, it's the Poles, it's the Russians who are here who are really causing this conflict. They're not Canadian. These are remnants from the printing press. This is the Labour Temple, actually. Well, I think so. Well, this whole floor is archives. Hmm. This is all photographs. And then there's the cutter downstairs in the basement. Yes. So this is WBA archives, except for the books there and the stuff here for sale. History of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. Yeah. History of the USSR. And when the RCMP raided, they, uh, they came up the stairs on the other side here and came up into this part, into the editorial offices. There were four or five of us. Chief Newton was the leader. So we go up to the door, break in the door, and there was nobody there except some old man. And they were taking material, sweeping materials off the, off the desk, putting it into, into boxes and into bags that they could uh, then take it back and they, it would be sorted and they would find what they could to demonstrate that this was this Bolshevik revolution. So yeah, it was pretty amazing. One of the men involved in the raids on the Ukrainian labor temple was Winnipeg lawyer W.P. Fillmore. We just proceeded to open drawers and whatever was there and look for things. There was a book by Lenin and other communist literature. I came up to a box or a bench which was locked. I had on my wrist a short baseball bat, so I gave it a tremendous heave. And the lid flew open and the bat flew back, hit me on the head and knocked me down. So I was wounded in action, and I don't know if I ever got better. This advertisement appeared in the Winnipeg Citizen on May 30th, 1919. Don't be misled. The only issue is Bolshevism. The issue is the principle of the general strike as a weapon for enabling a Bolshevist few to ride roughshod over citizens at large. Don't be misled. Kill it now. It's the usual thing that's brought up. At any time when there is activity amongst the workers on some definite point, always you'll get the chance that this is a, a plot of some sort. And every little bit of a thing that is brought up is called a communist plot. You had that in Winnipeg, and that is why they brought in the, the boys from the north, you know, with the Russian names. They were swept into the net, too. As I said in an article I wrote in quoting Gilpin Sullivan's Poobah, a uh, mere corroborative detail, intending to add a touch of verisimilitude to an otherwise bald and unconvincing narrative. This conspiracy business is, all, is overdone. Of course, it, it, it makes good stuff for brainwashing uh, the generality of the population. Who was doing the brainwashing? Well, the usual media. I don't mean the free press. I mean the Tribune and what was the other one called? The Tribune that I call the Spittoon. And then there was still another one that was even more yellow than that. I'm Tom Saunders. I'm a retired lawyer, now living in Ottawa. I am the great-grandson of uh, A.J. Andrews, who was one of the Committee of uh, 1000 who opposed the, uh, the Winnipeg General Strike of 1919. 
Well, A.J. Andrews was a, if you're a member of the Citizens Committee, A.J. Andrews is a hero. If you're a member of the Strike Committee, he's uh, he's a number one villain. My great-grandfather arrived in Winnipeg in 1881, basically penniless. He and, and those of his friends and, and others, obviously, in the community basically took that one road, dirt road town and turned it by uh, the beginning of, of World War I into what was known, of course, as Chicago of the North. It became a massive uh, rail hub with industries and businesses thriving. He's a lawyer. He lives in Crescentwood. He's sort of dabbling in real estate. He's a uh, conservative. He has good political connections in Ottawa. And he is, with a number of others, he's very determined to crush the labor movement. I've always thought of it this way. As the events around leading up to the strike started to culminate, I have to think that they would have viewed those events in the context not only of their times, but what they knew. And what they knew was not the kind of modern employment, labor relations environment that, that we enjoy today. But their precedence for, for the kind of social unrest that was part of, of the strike would have been looking back to perhaps the, the French Revolution and most certainly I would suspect back to the Russian Revolution. I don't think it would be unreasonable to suggest that they were apprehensive of what, of what events were happening around them. I don't believe for a minute that Andrews believed that Canada was on the verge of revolution. He doesn't like these people. He doesn't like these immigrants. He doesn't like these, these radical trade unionists. He's not even willing to discuss with them uh, the issues. Did they actually think there was a conspiracy? You know, and remember, they argue that this was a conspiracy of uh, enemy aliens, right, to some extent. Germans and Bolsheviks and so on behind it. I don't think that, for the most part, they could have believed that because they knew who the leadership of the strike was. The Citizen, the Citizens Committee newspaper, to that extent, was simply saying untruths. I think that the caricature of A.J. Andrews as sort of a fat cat lawyer probably is, is a bit inaccurate in the sense that you must recall that he did not grow up in a privileged environment. So if in the end he had a degree of success, it wasn't that he achieved that with a silver spoon or with any great advantage. It was because he worked hard. But another thing that's generally true is that people who are privileged are not really aware of their own privileges and the role it plays in getting where they are now, that they had access to opportunities and capital and, and so on. Many figured the strike would end in a few days, but it didn't. It had gone on for weeks. And we had six weeks holiday, and I think those six weeks were the most beautiful weather we ever experienced in Winnipeg. And by this point, even the police were on strike. So the Citizens Committee came up with an idea. They'd hire new men to replace them, the special constables, or just plain specials. Businesses in Winnipeg, prominent business people in Winnipeg, had always taken political power very seriously. So the Citizens Committee of a 1,000 opposed, of course, the right to collective bargaining. But the Citizens Committee of a 1,000 also supported things like the hiring of unqualified police officers, right, the, the specials. So it, it's not a very pleasant picture to think about, legally speaking, in terms of the power of the state being brought to bear against people who were, for the most part, organizing very peacefully. Hank Scott of Winnipeg was one of the specials. The whole problem was that the Committee of 1000 had decided that each and every individual who was on the side of the law, as it were, must carry a belly, and it was this long, and it was a, a wagon spoke bought from Lori Wagon Works on Rupert Street. Well, they were dressed in suits. They were equipped with billy clubs. Um, some of those were thought to have been wheel spokes. Others were regular billy clubs, and they had a, a hole through the end. And they 
board to hold through the uh, the top end of it. And a string so they could swing it around. Then they had a, a big piece of uh, cotton uh, rope. They formed a troop, formed a troop of mounted men and armed them with spokes, hickory spokes, wagon from wagon wheels. And it fitted over your wrist. And you went down the street and you had this confound thing. It would be about two feet long. There were wagons full. The fact of the matter is, I still think it put Laurie in business. And the Citizens Committee swore in a bunch of men as policemen. So they called them special police. But actually, most of them were a bunch of gangsters, you know. <laughs> they weren't they, actually... Well, nobody, any, any decent man wasn't going to go and uh, join, uh, join the police when the police went out on strike. Violence only began to really simmer on June the 10th, when the local constabulary of, if I remember correctly, some 225 men, was replaced by a special police force of 2,000. Second story men and forgers, burglars and whatnot, I think mostly from Minneapolis, the place of the police. This big crowd up walk, walking down Main Street, both sides of the street, where there used to be Jerry Robinson's building and where the Macint at the end of the McIntyre, between the McIntyre building and Portage and Main, the special police were going around and they were working in the base at uh, two's company, three's a crowd. And if three people stopped to speak, they would come in to break the thing up. Where I was standing, quite close to where I was standing, there was three chaps talking. This uh, horseman came along and says, keep going, get moving, get moving. And he was carrying a baseball bat. And this fellow came along with his billy and whacked him and got him out of the way. At the same time, he put a whistle in his mouth and he started to blow, blow, blow. blow. This is, he was interviewed in the Free Press. And he also told, for laughs, he said, this billy came in handy afterwards because I gave it to my mother and she used it as a rolling pin for 42 years. <laughs> By week six, the Citizens Committee has had enough. There are no negotiations. It's a stalemate. Then they hit on the idea that has served authoritarian regimes well throughout the 20th century, nighttime arrests of the ringleaders. It was shortly before, approximately around 2 o'clock in the morning, as I recollect. We were all asleep when there was a knock on the door, and the mounted police came in and asked Mr. Heaps, or Alderman Heaps then, to get dressed, that he was, uh, that they were taking him in. Naturally, there was turmoil. Mrs. Heaps came terribly upset. The children were disturbed. But uh, everyone was peaceful, and he got dressed, and he went along with them. The arrests are, are a flashpoint. The, the returned veterans are trying to figure out how they are going to support the, uh, the arrested strikers. They want them released. So they decide that they are going to organize a, a march, uh, a silent march through the streets of Winnipeg in protest of the arrest of these strike leaders. The silent march by veterans takes place on Saturday, June 21st, known afterwards as Bloody Saturday. They start to assemble on Main Street, stretching from Portage to down past City Hall. Crowds and crowds of people show up to support and to watch the mayor decides something's going to have to happen to put these people in their place. So he contacts General Ketchen, who brings the, the troops out. They all assemble at Portage in Maine. The military is there with them. The scene is set. I think it's 2.50 in the afternoon. A large crowd had uh, assembled. I was amongst them in front of the old Winnipeg City Hall. There were thousands of people there. I went over to see the chief of police from my office somewhere around noon. Hugh Phillips was a member of the Citizens Committee of a Thousand. And as I crossed to Main Street, I noticed a tremendous gathering up at the City Hall. I walked up a little bit to see, and then I saw what was going on. The, the crowd, the mob, was trying to upset a streetcar, which apparently had been operated by... Uh, volunteers. I took the back route round by the grain exchange and I went and reported it to the chief of police. He asked me what I thought he should do. I said it's a very serious riot. I think you should call out the mounted police. The crowd is filling the street and the streetcar is forced to stop. And the crowd 
is angry because scabs are operating the streetcar in defiance of the strike. And they start pushing and shoving on the streetcar, trying to knock it over. They manage to get the connection to the wires above disrupted, and they manage to push the streetcar a little bit off the track. People start picking up stones, rocks, whatever they can find. Just as the Mounties got to James, the corner I was standing on, I saw things flying around that looked like snowballs in them. And then suddenly a, a horse got one of those white things. There were rocks. They were thrown rocks from the building across the street. And I was on this, the other side of the street. And the, as the rocks hit the pavement, they would bounce. I came running out there to be faced with a number of horses coming right abreast, all the way charging down the street. But I was lucky because standing right in front of this James Rich, at least this building, was a T-model and open Ford touring car, but with the top down. And I couldn't have stopped and turned and got out of the way of these horses, but I took them another two steps forward and dived headfirst right into the back seat of this car. <laughs> By this time, the crowd, they're panicked. The police are firing on This is a Canadian city, but why are the police firing on their own citizens? This, this is not something that happens, right? A couple of the Mounties fired into the crowd and one man was killed and another and there were two or three badly wounded. One man uh, dropped dead with a bullet through the heart on William Avenue quite close to Main Street. And they ran like rabbits, like rabbits. Now I don't mind frankly confessing to you, I've always felt an inner sense of gratification in the memory that amongst others, I too threw a stone at the charging Mounties. And my only regret is that my aim was so damn poor, <laughs> I missed. Historians are often interested in why revolutions break out in one place or another. And Karl Marx always talked about, you know, that capitalism created socialism, created the conditions. And so you would think that in some of the most advanced places is where there would be big uprisings. But they tend to happen places which are sometimes the weak link, where the social order was vulnerable one way or another. So Winnipeg was an industrial city in many ways, right? It was sort of the industrial center of the prairies producing all sorts of things. But it was not one of Canada's major industrial centers in that sense. And so what's interesting in Winnipeg was how quickly it spread to workers who really had never had a chance to form a union. Why did that happen? Well, that to some extent is a big mystery of the strike, but it has to do, I think, with this kind of class identity. Class identity and, as it turns out, age and demographics. Winnipeg was a very class-divided city where there was extreme wealth and extreme poverty. But it was also a new city. It was a new town, and there was a kind of openness here. The reform movement in the West was also very strong, the social reform movement. So social reformers who may not have been entirely comfortable with labor activism or particularly with striking supported labor rights in general. It was kind of a place where expectations and norms were still, I think, a bit more fluid than they were in older Eastern Canadian communities. So there was a certain kind of meeting point thing that happened here, a meeting of different cultures, uh, of socialist traditions from Europe, of social gospel traditions from Britain and the U.S. and so on. There are other places where, that were getting close. You know, uh, certainly Vancouver, there were people organizing in Toronto and in many other places across the country. I think one of the, the differences in Winnipeg, I think partly it was the youthfulness of the, uh, of the leadership. They are radicals. They believe in socialism. There was no bones about it. That's what they were. They wanted to rebuild the country. The youthfulness of the leadership. That's one reason why you didn't see strikes of this magnitude in Toronto or Montreal where the union leadership was older and more conservative, and more prone to holding meetings rather than demonstrations. Their youthfulness is also a way to talk about the legacy of the strike right now. The issues from 1919 are relevant today. We're facing many of the same kinds of problems with a small number of people uh, at the upper echelons who are incredibly, incredibly wealthy 
and a vast majority who are struggling on a regular basis to get by. And we look at today the same attempts to divide people around issues of ethnicity, the scapegoating of immigrants, the horrendous racism that we see on a daily basis towards indigenous people. It's always easier if we can define the problem as someone different than ourselves, because then the problem isn't us. The group being demonized always changes, but there's always a group being demonized. Yeah, they probably talked about building a wall between the North End and the South End in Winnipeg during the strike. Well, the, the railway have managed to serve that function in part. You know, we can talk about labor, the labor movement being um, under a tremendous pressure right now. But we can also point to the politicization of young people who are activists, who are acting. I think I can't explain it, but I, I know that, 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 you know, something that people have commented on is why is there among young people in Canada and elsewhere um, a resurgence of anarchism? What's going on with young anarchists, right, who are so interested and so politicized about that? Um, they're partly drawing on an intergenerational memory of, of other anarchists who've been involved in various activist movements. You know, there is a sort of a language of sort of oppor you make your own opportunities and all those sorts of things, but I think they're collectively nervous about it. And I think that they're collectively nervous about a combination of economic threats to them and environmental threats, right? It's a really tough time. And I think one thing that's important is to see these things as connected, right? They see that if you're going to have a, a life of prosperity and have a kind of future for the planet, you know, that it requires potentially some sort of action. And they see the same sorts of enemy at the end. You know, they see the 1%. There have also been, I think, significant critiques of labor that need, need to be addressed and, and are being addressed that make it has become easy to demonize unions in the workplace. People grow up thinking that unions are a barrier to their advancement as individuals, you know. So I think it's a combination of both the cultural and political conversation, but also the problem of living in a society where wealth inequality is growing, growing, growing every day. And struggles seem harder and harder to mount. And I think periods of collectivity come and go and they have ebbs and flows. And at the moment we're in an ebb. The last five years or so have been a series of commemorations in Canada, particularly of the war. And I've been thinking a lot and, and talking a lot about commemoration the last few years. But there really is no commemoration of labor struggle in Canada. Um, here in Winnipeg, where you know people in labor are in the middle of organizing and thinking about how to talk about 1919. But at the broader society, this doesn't seem to be an event that resonates with people as something to commemorate. And I think really think that that's a shame. Why? Um, I mean, not, not that it's a shame, but why are they not? Because I think, it, I think even now labor struggle is not something that dominant, the dominant society wants to talk about a great deal. Uh, we have a much more atomized workforce. We have declining rates of unionization, not as severe as in the U.S., but quite serious. And we have a struggling labor movement. And it's, it's not a labor movement that has as much political power right now as it could have or maybe should have, right? The type of almost spontaneous class identity that we saw in 1919 really did persist through the 1920s and 1930s. And then a number of things happened afterwards to kind of diminish that. Uh, to some extent, even starting in the 1930s, right, the Great Depression, that experience, and then prosperity after World War II, all those things tended to diminish class identity along with a certain amount of sort of business propaganda that this, these things really don't exist. But it was possible in prosperity, and largely and ironically because of the strength of the union movement, for people to rise out of the type of precarious and poverty-ridden existence that you associated with the working class. But, you know, so I think that's true, although my own kind of observation is that the rise of precarious labor, the fact that wages have been stagnant for decades now and so on, has meant that class is back on the agenda, and people think like that.
And you can see that in places like the United States, right, even in Trump's America, you have these astounding teacher strikes in places like Oklahoma, of all places. I do think we're making progress. It's tiring. You know, where there is a real sense of class kind of reemerging. We're going to keep going. We're going to keep pushing. And we're going to, the good guys win in the end. Some people got the idea that to put labor back 40 years. My reply to that is you can only go back if you've been forward. And at the time when the people went on strike, they were fighting for the principle to be allowed to organize. That was the basic contention of, of the 1919 strike. One more thing is in talking about the 1919 strike being a potential turning point. Mm -hmm. Because the workers, as you say, really thought something could happen here politically. Like the whole world could change. But the result was, no, the world didn't change because it ended violently, it was put down. And we've, always, we've seen since the sort of rise of a, of a business class, even, even informally, like in, in journalism, like there are business newspapers and business channels, and we talk of the business class making sense of the economy and never talk about working class or working people or labor, the labor movement having authority the way the business class does. So is that one of the legacies of the strike too, do you think? Well, the Lake of the Strike in that sense is kind of interesting because it's a little unclear what people thought the strike was going to lead to. I don't think they were very definite, which would be better, because they did see uh, even socialists at the time didn't really have an insurrectionary notion. They had a sense that, you know, this is a step perhaps in workers becoming more educated. The, the question about today Business has long had a kind of ideological project, right, to kind of, because they feel themselves to be the natural leaders of society, and they, and they want to share that with you. Uh, but I think that's received a number of big blows, and a huge one, I think, was 2008, right, the Great Recession, where economists and business and so on brought the economy to the edge of the precipice and people's faith in their ability to run society and run the economy, I think, was fairly deeply shaken. For business, it's ideologically a dangerous time because there's going to be another crash at some point, right? That It happens, and many of the ingredients to the last one are still around. And so that, you know, claims of anybody's ability to run anything is predicated on their ability to actually do it uh, without the wheels falling off. And, you know, if the wheels fall off, bets are off. It's okay if you don't have an answer to this. I'm trying to solve a puzzle, which is when the CBC did the 50th anniversary in 69, mm -hmm. I guess, they had Pritchard. Oh, yeah. He was on the phone from California, right? Because yes. he was on the board of the symphony or something. Right. And he said, uh, what he said at the time was, Only fools try to make revolutions. Wise men conform to them. Does that make any sense to you? Does, does it, have you ever heard that? Or does, do you know what he might have meant by that? I think it is, uh, it is a sense that it's foolish to try to start a revolution. But it's also foolish to try to stop a revolution, right? Once it's in motion, it's going to happen in one way or another. And I think that's probably the idea that it has, you know, like a giant, it's a law of inertia. It's hard to get started, but it's hard to stop. That's, that's the best explanation of the Pritchard quote I've heard. So well, thank you for that. Only fools try to make revolutions. Wise men conform to them. That's the lesson of history. You were listening to the 1919 Winnipeg General Strike 100 Years Later by contributor in Winnipeg, Tom Jokinen. Special thanks to the Manitoba Museum. Do go to our website, cbc.ca slash ideas, for more on the strike, including photos that will take you right to the streets of Winnipeg in 1919. The associate producer of Ideas is Liz Nage. Technical production, Danielle Duval. The executive producer of Ideas is Greg Kelly. I'm Paul Kennedy.
For more CBC Podcasts, go to cbc.ca slash podcasts.